um, as you said, that picture went viral uh, internationally. And so much so that a friend of mine, Avi, who has contacts in the media, got a telephone call during the coronation of King Charles um, from a Daily Mail reporter. And Daily Mail, of course, is the largest uh, English-read news site in the world with 350 million uh, views a week on their website. Wow. Um, and the reporter uh, was standing actually outside the palace waiting for Charles to go by and called Avi and said, I'd like to book a flight now while I'm standing here to come out immediately after the coronation weekend and to meet with Tali and Karen in a frat uh, and interview them. Uh, can I have an exclusive interview and I'll pay them a reasonable amount of money? So Avi got on the phone to me and said, I don't understand this. So the guy is standing literally at the coronation. It's probably the most important thing that's ever happened in England for, <laughs> for 50 years. And all he wants to do is to fly out to a frat. Joining us now on the VIN News Podcast, Rabbi Leo D. Rabbi D, several weeks ago, as everybody probably knows, Rabbi D tragically, unspeakably suffered the loss of his wife, of his da- da- two, two of his daughters, Hashem Yimker and Demem. Rabbi D, thank you for joining us. I really hope this will be a positive experience. I, I I don't have any words to say. I, I'm so sorry about your loss, and I wish there was some more I could say to mitigate, you know, what you're going through. But, but I want to thank you for being here. Thank you. Shalom. Yes, shalom. And um, when I saw following, like like everyone at Klai Israel, when we followed, you know, what went on, and we'll you know discuss some of your experience, and I have some questions, and I think a lot of people do. I, I I right away saw you know there were videos that emerged about you of, of you uh, doing has paid them uh, at, at at your shiva and the, 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 I saw this this is somebody who you you it was just mind boggling to me how number one it seemed that you were coping in a way that I'm sure was not easy but but I saw that you somehow managed to use this experience. And you obviously, you know, you're still going through this, and and almost all of us, in some way, in some extended way, are, are, I feel like we're going through it with you. I think, but um, I saw that you know you were using it to to reach out to people. You were using it to somehow send positive messages to somehow bring people together. So I want to ask you a lot, a lot of details, but uh, you know, what what would be your response to that? Um, interesting. I was asked to speak about Gula yesterday at um, the Great Synagogue in Jerusalem, and um, that was the topic of a conference. They had about a thousand uh, girls aged eighteen to twenty-five. Wow! So when I had to think about what is Gula, first the first thing that came to mind was how would you even translate that into English? Although I was speaking in Hebrew, it wasn't really a question. But uh, <laughs> uh, what, what do we call Gula in English? Redemption, salvation. Um, these are words that have no meaning, and you know we don't know what they mean. It's like you know, often it's like kedusha. We say it's holy. What does holy mean? You know, so um, right. we, there are many different words which we band around, and uh, they don't have any meaning. But the reason that gula doesn't have any translation into English or into any other language is because it has to come from us. I think it's something which comes from the Jews, and it's um, therefore untranslatable in any other language. And, and what I described, described to them at the time was basically how Geula comes uh, because we make a choice to do a Kiddush Hashem and not to do a Chil Hashem. Um, so what, what creates light in the world is a Kiddush Hashem, and what destroys light in the world is a Chil Hashem. And uh, we, we all know that uh, every single one of us is capable of doing one or the other. So uh, but these, these are all lessons which... You know, which I learned as a student and, and then as I taught as a rabbi. Um, and little did I know that I would actually have to try and actually take my own messages to heart at some point. Um, but um, I did. That's incredible. Yeah, but like you say, the ability to, it's one thing when it's in theory, it's one thing when it's something that's being taught, but then you have to be able to apply it in any in any capacity, but, but certainly in one as trying as this. Um, Along those lines, when you talk about Kiddush Hashem and Chil Hashem, I, I, I think one of the things that captured all of our attention was this incredible, uh, you know, you you had your your wife, uh, Allah uh, Shalom, her organs, you had many of her organs donated and saved multiple lives that way. And then, of course, there's, there's been this video out there 
where uh, of of you and your children meeting the recipients of the organ donations, literally the people whose lives you saved, uh, listening to the heartbeat, uh, your wife's heartbeat. These are these are you. You cannot imagine the impact that this is having on people like me who do not know you, who have never met you, random strangers, Jews and non-Jews alike. I would add. Um, can you describe what that's like? And am I correct that one of the recipients, um, it was not was not even Jewish, was was an Arab? And you, 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 I believe I saw that you met with that person several weeks ago. Correct, Yaakov. Um, yeah, I mean, in Kiddush Hashem, I, I tell you the strange thing was obviously a few weeks ago we went to Bellinson, and then we met the um, recipients of one kidney and the liver and the heart. And Lital, and of course, Karen, my daughter, um, was seen listening to the heart through the stethoscope, yeah. which apparently in Israel is not uncommon because in Israel, it's a small country. If somebody uh, dies suddenly and somebody receives an organ the next day, they pretty much know where it must have come from. Whereas, you know, bigger countries, that doesn't happen. So they keep the confidentiality. That's apparently what goes on. I never so, thought of that. Fascinating. I never thought of that either. So, so uh, basically... Uh, in Israel, um, they do this often, uh, just don't tend to do it in front of a worldwide audience. So, um, as you said, that picture went viral uh, internationally. And so much so that a friend of mine, Avi, who has contacts in the media, got a telephone call during the coronation of King Charles um, from a Daily Mail reporter. And Daily Mail, of course, is the largest uh, English-read news site in the world with 350 million uh, views a week on their website. Wow. Um, and the reporter uh, was standing actually in outside the palace waiting for Charles to go by and called Avi and said, I'd like to book a flight now while I'm standing here to come out immediately after the coronation weekend and to meet with Tali and Karen in a frat uh, and interview them. Uh, can I have an exclusive interview and I'll pay them a reasonable amount of money? So Avi got on the phone to me and said, I don't understand this. So the guy is standing literally at the coronation. It's probably the most important thing that's ever happened in England for, you know, for 50 years. And all he wants to do is to fly out to a frat. Um, <laughs> so they did. So we booked a time. It was actually like my own there. Uh, so the girls have been up late the night before with their friends. So we booked at 12 o'clock on the Tuesday. And uh, out came these guys, presumably the night before, before the, the journalist and the, and the cameraman. Um, and they were sitting with Avi was there very kindly sitting with them um, in the lounge. And I came in about half an hour later just to see they were OK. And I offered them a, a, a drink and a, and a cake. And they said, no, 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 go away. Don't worry, we're, we're busy. So they had no interest to speak to me, which is great. They were speaking <laughs> to my daughters. They only the question they want to ask was, what did you feel when you heard the heart? And, and, and it was such it, it was such a kiddush Hashem that that. These you know, English journalists came out from England where they have 30 times the number of, of transplants every year that they do in this country because it's a bigger country and there's a much larger number of people who give uh, organs. But they had to come from England to um, uh, to right. in Frat, right? The way, what they call the West Bank, what we call Judea and, Sh and Shomron, right. um, in order to um, interview my daughters about this. And then it went viral on, on their web website and I said to I said to Karen, I said, your tears have saved thousands of lives. I mean, literally thousands of lives because, you know, people have seen this. Anyway, so I was inspired by that. And um, I called up a friend of mine, um, Paul, uh, Paul, I'll just call him Paul, uh, who is a BBC uh, reporter who basically the two of us were very friendly 30 years ago. But then we sort of were out of touch a bit. And he's a religious Jew, but also a BBC reporter. And he writes for the Mirror newspaper, which is like the New York Times. Sure. So it's not very pro-Israel, not very pro-Jewish. Um, and I said to him, look, I'm, I want I want somebody to come with me I can trust to do the story. Um, I'm going to meet the guy, um, the Arab Israeli in the north of Israel, who received the other kidney. Uh, will you please come? So uh, this is Friday morning. Um, he said, well, I can't fly to Israel. So I um, will have to, um, he said, I'll have to fly to Cyprus and then I'll come on Sash. Motzei Shabbat, I'll come, uh, come over. So he did. The Monday, two o'clock, we arranged to go up to um, to see this uh, fellow, um, Abu Radia. We, it's not his complete name. His actual name is, is but his young oldest son is called Radia, so we call him Abu Radia. Um, he, he was a little bit, or he, he had a, um, a Hamas minder, let's put it this way, a Hamas minder called Mahmoud, who was the guy I was put in touch with. And he, he said to me initially, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, no, the guy, the guy received the kidney is lovely fellow, but um, he would, but the hospital, actually the Jewish hospital, was very cautious about putting him in the media. They didn't want him to be in the media because they felt that it would put his life at risk from Hamas. Oh wow! Any any good news wow. between Arabs and Jews is is immediately a topic of controversy in uh, the Palestinian Authority. They, they're very much unbelievable. Involved. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, so. I got this kind of. I got Friday morning, just before I called Paul to come out. I got this call from Mahmoud saying, "I don't think it's a good idea for you to come out while the Gaza operation is happening. Uh, maybe in one month's time." And I'm thinking to myself, "What is the connection between Gaza and my wife's kidney right. and this guy?" So I said to him, "I said, Mahmoud, I tell you what." I said, I happened to be in um, the area anyway on Monday at 2 o'clock. It was any time I had my diary, and I had Paul coming out. Uh, well, I had planned to have him coming out. So I said, I'm coming anyway. I'll knock on his door. If he's there, he's there. So my boy said, wait a minute. He says, Sunday night, I'll call you, and I'll tell you how he's feeling. Sunday night, of course, he calls me. He says, uh, he's feeling very, very bad. You really should not come. He said, he's very, very ill, and maybe come in three weeks' time. So I said, I said, I'll tell you what, Mahmoud. I said, I'm up here anyway. Uh, I, will, I, will, I will knock on his door. And we knocked on his door. He opened the door. Actually, we came an hour late. So I don't know if Mahmoud was waiting at two o'clock. But anyway, three o'clock, uh, we turned up an hour late. And we knocked on the door and op uh, opens it, this lovely fellow with a bandage around his stomach. He gives him a massive hug. I give him a gift, uh, which is a, in Hebrew and Arabic, saying, you are my blessing, or my, my miracle. And he gives me a gift, which uh, actually had an interesting quote. And in it. it said that somebody who saves one life um, is as if they Keep saved the whole, whole world. Somebody who, who takes one life is as if they took the whole world. So, so I thought, how does this guy, who's a you know, nice carpenter, he hadn't been able to work as a carpenter for five years because he'd been on dialysis for four days a week. And now after the kidney transplant, he was able to go back to work and, and, uh, and resume. Um, but how did he know how to quote from the Mishnah in Sanhedrin? Because actually it was a very, very clever uh, Mishnah to quote. And I thought, so how does this, this regular Arab guy no, you know, such a Talmud Chacham, such a great rabbi. So it was only later that day. So, so afterwards, we went to Haifa because I have some friends, some Arab friends in Haifa. And Paul wanted to meet them. We went to the mosque in Haifa and I'm friendly with the imam there. And, um, and I asked my friend, uh, uh, Muhammad Sharif, who's the imam in, uh, in Haifa. I said, how would this guy have known how to quote from the Mishnah in Sanhedrin? He's, and, and I quoted him. I said, wait, wait, he broke out a copy of the Quran in English, with English translation. He showed me a verse in the Quran that was a direct quote from the Mishnah in Sanhedrin. That's and then he showed me a direct quote in the Quran from a Gemara that was in an Abrachot. And if you think about it, the Quran was written, apparently was the scribes were Jewish, the early scribes of the Quran were Jewish. And they were selected by Muhammad because they were the literate, most literate people. And it was written after the finishing of the Talmud, basically. So the Mishnah and the Abbasid Torah and the Hod Tanakh was all available. Right. So there are quotes in it. And then you show me other verses which talk about the uh, Kibbutz Galiot, the incoming of the exiles of the Jewish people to Israel uh, at the time of the Mashiach. Like, so all, all, these, all these things That's appear it. in the Quran. And, and this, this friend of mine, by the way, is, is a tremendous, tremendous man. I mean, his, his community are lovely. Uh, they are partners for peace. And together we're working Good actually imam. together on... On, on, on trying to create something that could bring everyone here together. And wow, wow. And that is the part of this. I mean, that is fascinating on so many levels. But the part of your story that I keep seeing, like I said, just from afar, uh, from a long distance, the, the, the level of Kiddush Hashem, number one, how you care about not only Jews and not only about Kal Yisrael, the, how deeply you care about Eretz Yisrael, about, about Jews and about non-Jews alike. And the fact that you're even saying, you know, you, you, I, I feel like you are connecting so many groups of people. In other words, connecting, you know, the non from with the from yet the 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 spectrum of of people of leaders that you had come to be Menachem of you and that you connected with. And I want to ask you about a couple of those experiences in a moment. It, I, 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 so we, we went. I, I actually had Yehuda, my son, in the car with me um, on the way up to the north of Israel because it was his it was his daddy time and. Uh, we were going to go to the pool, but instead I said, come with me for this journey. So, so my friend Paul took his car behind us because I wanted to have this private time with my son. So we had, that was our connection time. Um, so he came with me. So we, we had to pop in and we got to Haifa just in time to dive in Mincha um, in the local shul. Then we popped over to um, Muhammad's uh, um, um, mosque, which is the most beautiful building I've ever been in, in my life. That's the most beautiful. I mean, anyone visiting Haifa should go and visit this, the Ahmadi Mosque 
in wow. Haifa. It, it's absolutely incredible. It's just full of light. And, and um, so he invited us. They were they were davening a ni'ila. I, I call it ni'ila, which is the fourth service of the day after Mincha. And uh, they invited us into the mosque. So you and I are sitting on chairs. They're all bowing down, saying al Akba. And at the end of that, uh, Muhammad says to me, okay, now I want you to come and give a Dvar Torah. Um, they all speak Hebrew, so I spoke in Hebrew. And I gave a 10-minute Dvar Torah to his uh, 50 uh, congregants there. And I talked about Emet. And I said that, you know, your leader, Muhammad, is a man of Emet. Emet is um, truth. And it means, and it's written in Hebrew from Aleph to Taf, with Mem in the middle. That's right. how it's written. So there's a famous drosha in the, in, the, in the Talmud that says that Emet uh, also from M to Met, from mother to death. So it's basically truth is when you see the whole picture. And um, Sheker, it's the opposite. Um, well, it's not really the opposite. It's a lie. But Shem Kofi three letters that come together at the end of the alphabet. So they're stuck together. So in other words, if you focus on one thing uh, and you basically are polarized in your, in your outlook, then it's basically that's a lie. If you are able to stand up and look at the whole picture, then you can see the truth. And I, I said that yeah, his leader... Um, can see the truth because we were talking about a lot of different things and we agree on so many different things. But um, the truth um, is more complex than the sheker and the lie. So that's why people struggle with it in our generation. Uh, they spend too much time playing Minecraft, Facebook, etc. Um, and um, as one rabbit put it, they said, you know, my story was a little bit different to other people because often when this happens, thank God it doesn't happen so often. But if it, you know, when somebody is bereaved in this way. They go one of two ways. Either they say, I hate every Arab, um, and that is you know, probably the majority, or they say, I love every Arab, and they start hugging the mother of the terrorist, and that's the other possibility. But I stood up, apparently, and, and made distinction. I said, I love the Palestinian Arabs, you know, who are good people, and frankly, the ones who are their leaders and the terrorists, they need to be neutralized and uh, uh, you know, basically canceled. Um, so it's, it's a message of shalom, but not of peace. Why, why do I say that? So peace is um, like a mosaic. Every piece is exactly the same uh, shape. And you put together, creates a nice picture. But every piece has to actually fit. It has to be cut up into the exact square. Right. Um, and I say shalom is like a jigsaw puzzle. That every piece is completely different, and they fit together in a unique way. Um, and that is our idea of shalom. And um, you know, Shalom Incredibly is a bit more complex than peace because uh, peace, you could say, I love everybody, I hate everybody, whatever. But, uh, generally, I love everybody. Um, shalom, though, you know, is um, you need these complicated pieces to come together. And as, as anyone who's done a jigsaw puzzle knows, if the table uh, cloth isn't uh, completely flat, it doesn't work. So the terrorists um, and the evil people are a little bit like the sort of the uh, wavy tablecloth. But you have to get rid of that before you can put the pieces together. So the you know, shalom requires um, other things to be in place before you can actually have it. Peace is this sort of unattainable uh, uh, ideal that um, you know requires everyone to be the it's same. An, it's an incredible perspective. And when you did make that comment, and I'm familiar with the comment you're talking about about how you don't have a, you know you you do love the the Palestinian people and distinguishing that way, it, it was, it was incredibly powerful. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure any media outlet that covered it properly, that, that had a huge, huge impact on so many of us. And you said it, you know, so early on, the fact that your perspective is, is so refreshingly clear. I, I honestly don't know how you, how you find the strength and slightly related. I wanted to ask you slightly. <laughs> um, you had an encounter during Shiv, I believe, was it with the Sadi Gur Rebbe? And, <laughs> um, and you asked him, Am I correct? Correct me if I'm wrong. You asked him maybe why he doesn't say Hallel uh, on certain on, on, on certain holidays. On Yom Atzmut. Him on Yom Atzmut, was that it? And uh, and he gave you a response. He talked about his father. Can you can you describe that? Because that was another extremely powerful um, right. image um, that you got. I, I I don't remember the whole story. Maybe you remember it better than I do. But I, I think there were a lot of the Haredim who came to the Shiva tent. I said, and it was coming up to Yom Atzmurt, and so I said, you know, will you say Hallel on Yom Atzmurt? And they answered, to heal him. And their answer was to heal him, meaning that they would say Hallel, but without a bracha. So in other words, for them, it's not a religious thing to say. And you know what, actually, I, I've come to the conclusion that as religious Jews, often we do um, depend a little bit too much on our prayers. Um, so I, I don't know how much, uh, probably nobody knows about this, but on um, Yom Yerushalayim, I actually prepared a few flags, which I wanted people to carry on the march. 
and um, the, the thirty thousand of them actually and, uh, wow. at quite great expense. But uh, they said on them, uh, uh, free the Palestinian people from their evil regime, free the Gazan people from their evil regime, free the Syrians from their terrorist state, and free the, the Iranians from their terrorist state. And they were in English, Hebrew, Arabic, and the Persian one was in Persian. Um, and um, I was trying to convince uh, religious Jews to carry them on Yom Rishlaim march. And it was a very difficult uh, conversation, actually. I thought it wouldn't be that difficult to, to get convinced Jews to, to carry these things here, but to support uh, good Arabs to over, override, overrun their uh, evil regimes. But they, they um, you know, they, they said, what, what's this got to do with Jerusalem? I said, well, Jerusalem is about shalom, it's about peace. And peace means we actually have to do something. And I think right. that religious Jews often feel that since we pray for peace, you know, three times a day, and since the Kaddish ends with peace, and since the Birkata, you know, the blessing of the priest ends with peace, and since the blessing of Birkata Mazon ends with peace, and since we say the word shalom, you know, a hundred times a day in our, in our in our prayers, that we sort of, you know, that, that's, we, we, we've actually, we would say we've uh, fulfilled our, our requirement. Um, and I think that um, actually these Haredim who don't say hala uh, with a bracha, without a bracha, you know, if they were doing something else towards peace, I, I wouldn't uh, have a criticism of that. Maybe they are. So uh, I'm just, you know, so I, my, my attitude has changed quite, quite dramatically about this because I feel that, uh, you look at the early Zionists, they were actually not religious. Uh, and that's a fact. Right. So us, us religious Jews you know, have a lot to learn from some of the, uh, the not yet religious Jews um, or, or Jews who are religious in different ways. You know, Jews who don't eat kosher and keep Shabbat, but they love the land uh, to the extent that we can't understand. So, you know, we, we got Pasha Shalach this week. And, um, you know, and Hashem says, Shalach Lecha, uh, you know, send for yourself these uh, these uh, spies to Moses, and he chooses these guys. And ten of them, as we know, they don't love the land enough. Um, and the rabbis explain in the midrash that they just wanted to study Torah and live on Hashem's blessings, uh, with free handouts for food and free handouts for yeshivas and free handouts for everything else. And um, and it was Yeshua and Caleb who actually were the two who said, Let, "Let's let's go in and let's do it." And um, yep. So, so uh, we, we see that there are some people who love the land and fulfill that mitzvah. And it turns out, yeah, because of that, we, we were punished with the biggest punishment ever of 40 years in the desert. Everybody who'd come out of Egypt had to die before the next generation could go in. Wow. Um, so apparently this mitzvah of loving the land of Israel is quite important to God because the biggest punishment that, that the Jewish people ever suffered was because we didn't. Wow. So it's uh, interesting that uh, you know we don't see life in that way, that uh, we've got... Uh, millions of what we would call secular Jews who might be more religious than many of us. Wow, wow, fascinating. I, I, and just to clarify, how did your, your attitude changed? You're saying, in, in specifically, can you clarify that, how your attitude changed? Well, I, I, yeah, because I thought it would be easy to explain the idea of peace um, to religious Jews. And in fact, um, one of the things I was doing the week before um, Yom Yerushalayim, the, the Jerusalem Day March, was going to speak to every minister in the government and every uh, senior rabbi um, in the country uh, in order to, to ask them to close the the uh, Shashchem, which is the entrance into the Muslim quarter. Because every year there is a, a huge Chil Hashem, uh, a desecration of God's name, whatever that means in English, and um, whereby... Um, a bunch of yeshiva boys, 16-year-olds, dance around the streets singing Death to the Arabs. And you know, while they might think that's funny, um, what CNN does with it and other world uh, media is they cut that and they cut pictures of terrorists uh, shouting in the streets of Ramallah, Death to the Jews. And they say, look, these people are saying this and these people are saying this, so therefore they're obviously exactly the same. And what that leads to is next year, more terrorists being emboldened to go and c commit their atrocities because they're saying, well, basically, they hate us, we hate them. And uh, But the fact of the matter was, it was literally 20 Shiva boys, and there were 100,000 people who were absolutely you know, behaving well. The corollary to the story, by the way, is that um, I was very uh, honored uh, about a week ago, um, the head of from the Ministry of Education in Israel, who's in charge of all the religious yeshivas and all panot, so boy and girl yeshivas, uh, or schools, high schools um, in Israel, um, he came and, and he said, I'm in charge of 450 of these um, of these institutions. And here's a book of 40 projects that have been kicked off in the name of Lucy Meyer Rina. 
And he, you know, he, and there was literally 10, he was there for 10 minutes. He said, I just want to show you this. So I said to him, let's make a little film. And I'll say to all those 450 schools that if, you know, in two months time, there's any progress in any of these projects, I would love to come and see, maybe you make a little film for me and I'll come and sit there and I'll watch it with you. And then I'll talk to you. And that would be a nice way to sort of, you know, to, to move this forward. So we did. And at the end of it, I showed him on my phone, the picture of these, these high school boys dancing um, outside, the, on the, outside these people's houses in the, in, in the Muslim quarter. And I said to, uh, I said to him, I said, um, Boaz, I said, are these boys in one of your 450 schools? So he said, yes. I said, do you think you could identify them? He said, yes. I said, well, um, can I ask a favor? He said, okay. I said, can you identify them? Can you sum them up in front of Rabbi Eliyahu, um, Shmuel Eliyahu or Rabbi Lau, chief rabbi, yeah. and ask the rabbi to give them a very severe uh, telling off, um, a, a one hour uh, lesson about Chil Hashem, about what it means to desecrate Hashem's name, and then give them a project to clean up the Muslim quarter for a day or whatever other project is relevant in the Muslim quarter. And can you also capture it on camera and maybe we'll send it out to the TV stations and maybe we'll also distribute it to the 450 schools. He said, I'll do that. So uh, he's working on it at the moment. And if that happens, then maybe even if we have the doors open to the Muslim quarter next year, we'll see that CNN will be disappointed when they try and make that story up. Amazing, amazing. Your, your perspective, you know, like you said, your way to balance, you know, the 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 good and to constantly, constantly <clears throat> be trying to inspire people to do the good and to avoid. I it's just it, I cannot describe how inspiring it is to, you know, to to see your perspective and how you're 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 searching and trying to influence other people. And it, it's just it's just really amazing. I, I do want to ask you, I must ask you, because you mentioned CNN. I was going to ask you about it anyway. Uh, it is well known uh, that you know the the disgraceful way that uh, this Christiana Adam Poor, uh, what she described, she described the this horrific, horrific, unspeakable terrorist attack as a shootout, and then you know she th there was no apology, no retraction until probably they were afraid of a lawsuit. I know that she reached out to you in an email weeks later and uh, issued some kind of apology, which you did not do publicly, then you responded. And then even her public apology, you know, she never really clarified. You know, I think a lot of people felt it was very, very weak. Um, how do you feel about that in general? There is talk about you possibly filing a lawsuit. I know Alan Dershowitz and Ben Brofman both offered to represent you. And it, it really is so, so, so unspeakable. It's just so egregious, disgraceful, uh, that kind of treatment. So tell us about that. Yeah, I'm, look, my aim here is to change CNN, not to make a lot of money for myself. And if we do uh, actually sue them, the money will go to my Shalom Fund, which I'm hoping to set up, which will have projects for Shalom and, and not not for peace, by the way, but for Shalom. Um, and um, yeah, and um, to be honest, what she said was terribly upsetting, and of course we were we were desperately upset by it as a family. However, uh, what the interview I had previously with Christina McFarlane. Uh, which nobody mentions, I think it was on the 20th of April, uh, was far worse for me. Um, and the way she ended it, where she said, thank you, Rabbi D. And after the break, we're going to go to speak to a Palestinian who's in exactly the same situation right. as Rabbi D. I saw that. And that, would, to me, was such an insult. It's like, uh, who is this Jewish terrorist who just massacred three Palestinians at close range with a Kalashnikov and 20 bullets? And I haven't heard of him. So, you know, please right. make us aware, because obviously this is what they're referring to. Uh, apparently wasn't, but this is the sort of misleading uh, type of art, uh, articles that they have on CNN. Then I get an apology. Um, when I got the email from uh, Aminpour, I get an apology from Richard Green, who is the head of the um, Israel office bureau for, for CNN. And in the, in this conversation, I said to him, all right, I said, so are you basically equate, would you say there's a moral equivalence between my suffering and the suffering of the mother of the terrorist who was neutralized by the uh, Israeli uh, military in a moral way in order to stop other people from being murdered by him. And he said, um, with great respect, um, we have to differ on this, Rabbi D. Meaning, I, I, uh, I, I don't differentiate. And uh, I found that, you know, uh, uh, to, so uh, inhuman, inhuman that, you know, it says everything you need to know about, about CNN and what their aims are. So that's why I wrote an article, I don't know if you, if you saw it, didn't say it, you could maybe Google it on uh, Jerusalem Post this Friday. Um, it was an open letter to David Zaslav. And in the letter, I talk about the fact that he's now the CEO of Warner um, as well as CNN. Right. 
And I said that the Warner Brothers, the four of them, um, uh, set up in 1923. In the 1930s, they were the only studio in Hollywood that was making anti-Nazi films because apparently the Nazi consul to Los Angeles had been instructed by Joseph Goebbels himself, who was the Nazi propaganda minister, sure. um, to tell all the studios that they, didn't, that they should not produce anti-Nazi propaganda. Uh, and they all uh, agreed, except for the Warner Brothers, who were very brave at this point by breaking that, uh, that rule. Wow. Uh, I said they would be turning in their grave because now I said, um, you know, CNN is supporting these fascist regimes. Um, Israel is the only free country in the Middle East, and there are you know, 200 million people living as uh, slaves to Arab leaders who are fascist and, uh, and corrupt. And uh, CNN is supporting those regimes. So I said that the Warner Brothers would be turning their grave. Funnily enough, Harry Warner's daughter was married to my cousin. So I didn't, I didn't mention that, but it's. Uh, well, a small fact, which uh, David Zaslav might be interested to know. Um, anyway, at the end of it, I said to him, look, I said, you have a, yeah, I said, each of us has a choice in our life to be like Joseph Goebbels or uh, Yosef HaTzadik, Joseph, the righteous Joseph of the son of Jacob. I said, many people don't know, but jo Joseph, um, in the second year of the famine, had taken all the money and all the animals from, from the Egyptians. And so in the second year of the famine, they had nothing to give him. So they come to him begging him for food. And they say, we'll give you our land and ourselves as slaves to Pharaoh forever. And Joseph says, I will take your land for Pharaoh uh, and we'll charge you 20% tax, but I'm not going to take your slaves. So Joseph freed the whole Egyptian people from slavery. And I said to, um, I said to David Zatzlav, I said, you know, each of us has a choice in life to be the Joseph Goebbels or the righteous Joseph. I said, you know, and, and, and at some point one has to make that decision. And uh, obviously, I wasn't accusing him of being either one, but I was saying understood. That, uh, no, it's understood. The point is, it's incredible. It's incredibly powerful. It's un I'm absorbing it. I'm processing it. Unbelievably powerful message that you sent. Wow. And I, I mean, it's just it's unbelievable. I, I mean, and that exchange that you described is just unbelievable. You know, where where he said, you know, we see it differently than you, and really showed his true colors. This is not just something. They they, they, they they really believe this. I mean, at the end of that conversation, I said to him, I said, um, I said, Richard. Um, I am sickened by uh, CNN. I'm sickened by this conversation. Um, and I you know, I feel more angry with CNN than I do with the terrorists because the terrorist is some un uneducated guy who's been brought up on uh, you know, hatred from the time he's born. He's got no education. And he, all he knows is to do is to pull a trigger. I said, but CNN is, is manned by people who have degrees, and many of them exactly. uh, Ivy League degrees. And I said, I can't say that you're misinformed, so you must be misinforming. And therefore, you must be evil. I said, you're doing this all to earn a buck in order to advertise cheap Chinese goods that, that are basically nobody actually needs and selling petrol to fuel your American cars, which are polluted the planet. So, you know, you're all doing all this for basically a quick buck. And my wife and my daughters were killed by it. So thank you very much. So well said. I mean, you, you literally, nobody could possibly say it any better than the way you just said it. Uh, I, and I must ask, I mean, are you planning to file a lawsuit on CNN, against CNN? Can you discuss that or... Well, I, let's put it this way. Shura Tandin is a charity in Israel that um, yeah. came to my house uh, last week and said, look, we've got the top lawyer, um, I mean, as well as uh, Dershowitz, as well as Sprachman. Uh, we have a lawyer who's who's previously won a billion dollars in cash, actually, uh, in past cases. Your case is clearer cut than pretty much any other one that we've ever had, wow. both against CNN and against Hamas and against Fatah and against, you know, we, we can do multiple cases against multiple different parties here. Um, and um, they said, not only will we pay all the expenses, but we'll completely underwrite any risk to you of being countersued. Um, and we prepared to do it on that basis. So we'll send you a contract. And um, so assuming that they do, and I've asked them to go ahead with that, um, we'll see where that takes us. But uh, I think that it could be um, you know, something as long as it doesn't take um, much of my time. As I say, um, there are a lot of projects in Israel that could be very much benefited by a billion dollars of uh, CNN's cash and uh, could pay for a lot of good, uh, which would Absolutely. probably not make up for a fraction of the bad that they've done in the past 20 years, but um, yeah. would make some sort of uh, comp re recompensation for people okay. here. Yes, 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 yes. Wow. Final question. Um, how do you find the strength? You are doing such unimaginable things and such Kiddush Hashem. How do you find the strength? Um, up and down. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, 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 there are tough times as well.
I, 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 like I said, I cannot tell you how much of an inspiration you are, the Kiddush Hashem, the things you're involved in, your knowledge, your understanding, your love of people. You're so articulate, you're so eloquent, but your sincerity, your, your, your Avas Yisrael, but your Avas Abrias and, and your love of every human being is just something that's incredibly powerful. I really thank you. I think this conversation could be very beneficial, inspirational to many, many people. Thank you, Yaakov. Appreciate it. Rabbi, Rabbi Leo D on the Vindus podcast.